Kalias Publishing presents Part 1 of Hollywood on Trial by Dale E. Manalakis. Read by Dale E. Manalakis, member of Actors' Equity and SAG-AFTRA. Chapter 1 Sunset burned across the stormy Pacific Ocean. On the beach, director Nick Claren paced in the wet sand, eyeing the horizon. For his last shot of the day, he needed the surging November squall to hit shore before nightfall. Waiting for the cameras to roll on a submerged platform, actors Kristen Alba and Tiffany Sims fought the windswept swells near the Santa Monica Pier. The two leads, nude waist up but wet suited below, struggled for their footing. Tiffany yelled, I'm freezing. Why don't they start? Don't know. Night will kill the long shot from the beach, and the drones up there are whacked. Kristen studied the wind flurries battering the two drone cameras above. A wind shear hit, and one drone diagonal down at them. Watch out! Kristen, a veteran action star, covered Tiffany with his broad back. Tiffany screamed, I can't take this! Just hold on, Tiff. Kristen signaled the drone operator in the surf. Hey, watch out with those damn things! Kristen's shouts were lost in the wind, and so were Tiffany's protests. As a mound of ocean hit them, Tiffany clung to Kristen and screamed, Don't let go! Kristen wrapped his arms around her as the wave battered them, and then crashed on the pier pylons beyond. In the distance on the beach, Nick ran to the drone operator standing knee-high in spent, foamed waves. Nick muted his headset. What the hell happened? The operator said, The gust, they're worse. Nick responded, Deal with it, we're doing the take. No, the storm is here. It's too dangerous. Nick looked seaward. You mean too perfect. What a shot. The red sky, black clouds. The operator fought with the duo drone control box. Nick, just wait. I'm telling you. You're telling me nothing. We're doing it because the storm is here. The operator continued to argue. Kristen will walk out. Nick smiled. Walk out? Hardly. Kristen never quits, and she's too green to leave. It's too damn risky. Nick looked directly at the operator. So's being over budget. We're not coming back tomorrow. Nick unmuted his headset and announced, Everyone, it's time. On the pier, assistant director Quinn Kohlberg whispered into his headset, It's too late, Nick. We're losing control out here. Nick ignored him and commanded, Ready on the set. Nick's order blasted through the crew's headsets. His orders were law. The buck stopped with the director. On the pier, Quinn turned to see yet another wave pummel Kristen and Tiffany. I should get them out, Quinn thought, but instead followed orders. He signaled Kristen and Tiffany to get on their marks. USC Film School Student Project Years Ready, Floyd? This is a -a once-in-a-lifetime. One take, that's all we get. Floyd said, Mother Nature may not even give you that. She will. We can do it. Floyd lowered his voice. Remember the helicopter that killed... Nick frowned. Quiet, Floyd. Little drones can't kill anyone. Nick left and enthroned himself in his director's chair. As the wind plopped scattered rainburst into the dry sand, nervous sweat seeped down Nick's forehead from under his tan, tattered lucky cap. He hated Floyd resurrecting the helicopter crash in the Twilight Zone movie. Three actors died. He had known, too. He analyzed and thought, but that was a lightning thing with the helicopter. Nick watched the orange sun filtered below the low black clouds, dropping rain. Then from the pier, Quinn dropped a word bomb on his headset. Stein. There's Stein coming on the beach, Nick. Three o'clock. Stein in a new one. 
Nick replied, Damn, not now. Quinn cautioned, Play nice. Nick glared across the sand to the secured entrance at Josh Stein, the most powerful entertainment lawyer in the business. Nick took off his tattered good luck cap from his USC days and wiped his sweat like clockwork. That ass never forgets a nude scene and never comes alone. Josh Stein was the gatekeeper to the highest grossing industry talent, feared and respected by studios, directors, producers, and agents alike. He always showed up, as of right, at his female clients' nude scenes, scenes he bullied them into putting in their contracts. At the entrance to the shoot, Bruce, the bulked-up head of security, stepped aside for the infamous entertainment lawyer to the stars. Mr. Stein, welcome. Good afternoon, Bruce. She's with me. Following Josh was Caitlin O'Keefe, a statuesque, lean, striking young woman. The security guards pushed back the gawkers and paparazzi. They took a moment to stare themselves at Caitlin prancing in the sand behind Josh the man who was going to make her a star. Then a young man in a black hoodie ran by the distracted guards. Caitlin! Caitlin! They caught him ten feet in and muscled him back into the crowd. No! No! I'm with her! She's my girlfriend! The man struggled. Caitlin! Caitlin! Wait for me! Caitlin glanced back and mouthed, Get lost! This was her big break, and Ted Ripple ex-acting partner, loser and stalker, was not going to ruin it for her. Bruce got into Ted's face. Get out of here or we'll call the SMPD. Ted slithered away, mumbling. No cops. No cops. Back on the sand, Nick took the requisite minute to genuflect, greeting Josh like they were brothers, shaking hands, touching shoulders, patting backs. We're here in time? Josh asked. Nick turned off his headset. Just barely. How's Miriam? Fine. Josh slapped down Nick's domestic probe in front of his new Y&B, industry jargon for young and beautiful. This is Caitlin O'Keefe. Caitlin? Nick. Josh was always accompanied by the new talent he was grooming. Today, a sultry, long-legged beauty with a red mane glazed by the sunset. Caitlin purred. Love your pictures, Nick. Oh? He was transfixed by her eyes, light gray and lustrous, even in the fading light. Caitlin sat in the sand. Nick was gripped by the elegance of her long porcelain body. As she nestled into a comfortable spot, her white tube dress hiked up to reveal no undies. Nick thought, they're films, not pictures, sweetie. But with those assets, who cares what comes out of your pouty mouth? Nearby, Josh looked out towards the pier. So this is the beach nude scene I put in the contract? Yeah, we moved it to the ocean. Nick twisted his wedding band, watching Caitlin's delicate touch dusting the sand and rain droplets off her thighs. Josh complained, Hell, I see more skin when my housekeeper bends over. Josh smoothed his thinning hair whipped by wind flurries. Then he asserted his prerogatives by plopping his silk-suited, high-maintenance, pint-sized, but chunky body into the assistant director's chair. He represented both stars on the ocean platform. Kristen, whose Hispanic machismo Josh had molded into a seasoned action-adventure star, and Tiffany, the blonde bombshell he had stolen from her C-list entertainment lawyer. A storm gust forced Nick's attention back to his tape. The wind blast now carried strings of airborne foam and salty spray from the pounding waves. He turned on his headset. Are we ready? Affirmatives came from all positions. Nick announced, One take. No mistakes. Places. Quinn megaphoned and headsetted, thinking, It never rains in L.A., except today. Then the readiness and anticipation were shattered by fire and rescue sirens sounding up the cliffs along Palisades Park. Nick ordered, Hold, let them go by. 
Nick listened to the sirens passing on Ocean Avenue, turning left on Wilshire, stopping in three blocks at the trendy 3rd Street Promenade. For a film location, the world-famous Santa Monica Pier was always challenging, but sterling if you got your shots. Nick had planned a sunny, rainless November shoot with no sirens, summer crowds, helicopters, or small planes motoring above dragging banner advertisements. Instead, it was a circus. Kristen and Tiffany drew numerous onlookers and paparazzi. Worse, Nick got an un LA stormy day, the earliest in 50 years. He took the challenge head on. That's what made him an A-list director. He embraced the heightened drama and danger of the storm and was unthwarted by the gawkers and emergency sirens. As Kristen and Tiffany held their position, the storm swells hit faster, cresting and crashing harder into them and the pier pylons nearby. Kristen's powerful legs fought the heavy undercurrents. He held the two stars on the platform, built to make the shoot look natural in the unnatural depth. I can't stay. Tiffany shivered uncontrollably, wiping the salt water and rain from her face. Yes, you can, and will. Kristen tightened his grip around her. Let me go. Tiffany struggled. I'm quitting. No, you're not. Kristen lost his temper along with his subtle Hispanic charm, an affectation adopted for his career. Listen to me, Tiffany. I'm not coming back here tomorrow because of you. The sirens stopped. Quiet on the set. Ready, Nick commanded as he adjusted his lucky cap against the storm. Kristen smiled down at Tiffany. You see? We're ready. Quinn megaphoned. Quiet on the set. Scene six, take one. Action. Chapter three. This was the money shot. Kristen's and Tiffany's ostensibly nude, passionate kiss in the ocean. As their lips met, Quinn shouted into his megaphone, Kristen, duck! Kristen, who had worked with Quinn and Nick before, trusted them implicitly in dangerous action shots. When a command came, he reacted without question. A wind shear had pushed one drone down toward the platform. Tiffany held on to Kristen, frozen, terrified, and screaming. The machine sucked her hair into its airstream as Kristen pulled them underwater to safety. Cut. Scene six, take two. Action! Kristen placed his lips on Tiffany's again. Then, with cold calculation and experience, he cheated his face into the drone cameras mosquitoing around their heads giving him prime exposure over this ingenue. Kristen dominated the scene in both the long shots and the close-ups. He gazed at her as his face carouseled around into the lens of the close-up drone. He flexed his biceps, popping every pumped-up trainer-honed muscle above the water. Tiffany was unaware that Kristen had been upstaging her in every scene and every shot long, short, and in between. In this scene, she simply closed her eyes and kissed Kristen, throwing her arms passionately around his neck and pulling him into her. Kristen, the savvy pro, held her back to optimize his presence on the big screen. The public wanted him, and he made sure they'd get him. The wind whipped the swells, but Kristen maintained his pose. The now-burning, red, sinking sun contoured his striking face and definitioned body. When the drone came in fast and low for a close-up, he held still for the lens. He pressed his lips harder on Tiffany's, feigning passion, but preserving his professionally advantageous position. He vice-gripped her in place to ensure his limelight. As the drones and wind swirled around and the water sprayed over them, Kristen heard Quinn yell, Get down! Get down! Before Kristen but could go underwater again, a downdraft slammed the high-hovering drone into his head, 
a gush of blood blinding his right eye. The drone blade spinning out of control sliced through Kristen's cheek. He shrieked as his filleted flesh fell to his jaw. Blood poured down his neck and salt water seared through the open wound. He dropped Tiffany and pressed his cheek back into his bloodied face. Help! Help! Tiffany gurgled as the drone's blade rapiered into her neck. Blood spurted from her jugular and she flailed as the white-capped, red-stained sea sucked her under. Extra screamed. Nick yelled, piercing headsetted orders and ran to the pier. Josh and Caitlin followed. The crew mobilized at the pier with Nick. Sirens sounded up Ocean Avenue again, but this time for them. The SMPD backed the crowds to the east side of Ocean Avenue, the rapid-response parasitic media, voyeurs, and paparazzi. First responders clamored at each other, getting Kristen out alive. Then the organized chaos turned funereal as Tiffany's body recovery blanketed tense silence over the film set, the beach, the pier, and Nick, Josh, and Caitlin. When Tiffany went under, so did Nick's filming of Deranged. Chapter 4 Back in his ninth-floor Santa Monica law office that night, Josh sat alone drinking his coveted 18-year-old Dalmore scotch. His firm of Katz, Roth, and Fisher occupied the top four floors of the ultra-modern building at the corner of Ocean Avenue and Arizona. Nearby, at St. John's Hospital, his biggest money-making client, Kristen, was still alive, but with a ripped-up face. Josh turned and looked out his 12-foot-high, floor-to-ceiling windows. He surveyed the shoreline lights and pier with its glittering Ferris wheel and roller coasters silhouetted against the Black Sea. On that pier, Josh had consoled Caitlin during the rescue and recovery. She was crying and shaking. His plans for her delicate body that night were now as dead as Tiffany. Soothed by his scotch, Josh took out Caitlin's full-body headshot and compared it to Tiffany's. He put dead Tiffany's headshot in his outbox, where so many Y and Bs ended up for so many reasons. The major one being denying him his pleasures. Then, on the black and white glossy, he stroked his hands over Caitlin's pale cleavage and long legs spread suggestively. He wanted her. To him, Y and Bs were fungible commodities and fodder for his sexual proclivities. Proclivities that were now focused on Caitlin. Josh smiled. The Scotch revised his plans for the night. Caitlin has it, and it's mine tonight as planned, or I won't sign her. He drained his drink, saw the time on his wall clock, and thought, 7.30, better go face the music, again. The deranged fiasco had made him late to a seven o'clock meeting of the firm's management committee. The agenda? To tear him apart, judge him condemn him, and oust him from the venerable, full-service law firm of Katz, Roth, and Fisher. Chapter 5 Josh poured the last of his single malt into a coffee mug. He left to go listen to the caterwauling of the moralistic fools leading his firm, partners jealous of his industry power, and the women who came with it the young, the elegant, the mature, the exciting, partners who wanted to vote him out. He had defeated his partner's attacks before and would again. He alone judged his conduct. He earned his seven-figure income by creating stars, hand-holding neurotics, and controlling access to all the industry's A-listers, the arrogant, the emotionally stunted, and the egotistical aging legends. His contracts, pre-drafted but self-serving, were merely tweaked boilerplates 
but unintelligibly brilliant to his mentally challenged clients. Josh didn't touch any subpar talent, but did touch any ingenue, any way he wanted, any time he wanted. If charm and booze didn't work, drugs did. Josh was the power partner and head of the firm's entertainment department, a department that dominated the movie and music industries and had for over a century. He was its top rainmaker now and a solid member of the wealthy, privileged 1%. In his world, industry talent gave their agents 15%, managers 10 and Josh the lion's share for drafting ironclad, legally impenetrable contracts. That is to say, legally impenetrable, except where he embedded stealth studio escape clauses paid for by the studio heads. Getting talent to waive conflicts of interest with the studios was easy. After all, he took care of his talent, and they took care of him and his bank account. Josh only represented power stars, winners, the losers he dropped. He satisfied his varied appetites by partying with studio heads, directors, producers, and talent, both the old and the new. He helped the old stars stay wealthy by getting them money-sucking producer credits on multi-million dollar friend projects fed to the dumbed-down public. He helped the new stars get wealthy with prime film parts, those who would do anything to get to the top, that is, especially the female Y&Bs. 99.9% .9 of the Y&Bs were vapid, untrained, and unremarkable, most only worth a few dinners, a few snorts, and a few hotel rooms. The 0.1% who were contract-worthy, Josh primed for a career but only if they played the game, his game, a game that on this particular night had landed him in the eighth-floor law firm conference room, yet again. Arriving just late enough to make his point, Josh took the last empty chair, the hot seat at the head of the thirty-foot table. He had been in that seat before and viewed the scene with amusement. As he drank from his mug, his colleagues' mouths first verbally battered him about all his past sexual harassment settlements the firm had paid. Then they started on the most recent one, both catastrophic and the catalyst for this meeting. It involved him sexually assaulting a firm associate, the biggest claim ever made against Josh or the firm. The meeting's volume crested in the same pointless therapeutic catharsis he had heard before. The great debate whether to oust Josh or keep him running the money machine he had built. He leaned back knowing which they would choose, and that he would walk away unscathed, as always. He was the alpha dog in the highest paid pack of thieves at the firm. As usual, Without Josh speaking one word, the attack on him devolved into his partners turning on each other, full bore and red-faced. After all, the monetization of his clientele upped each and every one of their incomes by two-digit percentages each year, translating into pools, luxury cars, extravagant vacations, private school tuition, mansions, and opportunities for sex for at least half the room, more exotic for some than others. Josh enjoyed the outrage of this tribunal of senior partners, department heads, and one token junior partner, all of whom comprised the management committee. When he was through being amused, he would crush these sanctimonious lawyers, the many movers and shakers in their little worlds, with the truth. His truth, the only truth, that it was his world and that he had the power, not them. Chapter 6 Quiet, come to order! Managing partner Gwen Duggan shouted over the cacophony of ire 
to no effect. The diminutive woman stood at the other head of the table, picked up the heavy notebook of firm rules and procedures, and slammed it down. With the resounding bang, the verbal melee fell silent, all eyes on her. She announced the single item of business for the meeting, a full partner vote on whether to oust Josh from the firm. That required a majority vote of the tribunal. And if Josh lost that vote and chose to fight, a two-thirds vote of all the firm's partners would get the job done. With order instituted, Gwen honed in on Josh. Are you willing to resign instead of tearing this firm apart? Josh, already well lubricated, took a drink of his surreptitious Dalmor and wielded his power with casual clarity. I won't resign, Gwen, and this firm isn't going to be torn apart. This time is different, Josh interrupted. The only thing different is that this is a lazy, get-rich-quick female lawyer. I didn't try to rape that ugly bitch. She asked to drive the contracts to me, to my home in Malibu. I didn't. She was early. I was showering. I came out in a towel. She wanted to see my ocean view, so to speak. Intransigent and utterly without remorse, Josh grinned at his double entendre. The room rumbled, this time with expletives. Josh laughed. Listen, she was the one who giggled and jiggled and smiled. So I dropped my towel. Big deal. She gave the signals and then reneged. That's my story. Live with it. With that, the outraged and avaricious bottom-line money-grubbers resumed battling with each other. Josh enjoyed the circus of the ever-ineffectual group of lawyers and thought, Losers! But no more lady lawyers for me. They have teeth. My Y and B's don't. At the noise shooting from these pasty-faced pie holes, their mouths gaped like fish drowning in air. The sexually hungry who drooled at office ass, the sexually satisfied who fucked their secretaries, missionary position only, the family men who still required sex from their little wifeys, and the hypocrites married to their blonde trophy shitskas, screw-worthy but hardly marriage-worthy for a respected Jewish professional in his day. Josh's alcohol-infused mind floated back to his lost love, his shitska, long gone. I did my duty, he thought. I gave her up. I married Miriam. My parents died happy. No shitska got their only son. As he slowly drained what remained of his disguised scotch, the accusations, outrage, and exclamations crested to an orchestral fervor. Then, one voice rose above the others, claiming his soliloquy. Rolf Hagner, the balding head of the litigation department, stood. This disgusting sexual predator has to go. We've paid off enough to settle his four sexual harassment suits, and this one is rape. Hey, Josh shrugged. I never got that far. Hangner said, I'm calling for each of your votes to excise this liability and perversion from the firm. Hangner sat. Hold on. Just hold on there. Drew Brodsky, an entertainment lawyer who rode on Josh's immoral and immortally legendary coattails, protested. If this woman is lying, we'll be getting rid of the cornerstone of the firm and my good friend for no reason. Josh smiled at Drew, his faithful colleague whose career he had made with the spillover of his client base and who depended on Josh's leftovers for his sex life. Josh calculatedly did favors for enough partners to keep himself alive in the firm, even with his costly indiscretions. Hagner snapped back a staunch family man and temple-goer, a Mormon no less. Your good meal ticket, you mean. Gwen said, yours too, isn't he, Rolf? As its managing partner, Gwen wanted to appear even-handed, and above all, she always protected the firm's bottom line and her kids' college tuitions. Hagner jumped up again, slamming his fist on the table. Attempted rape is attempted rape. 
He has cost us more in payouts and wasted more unbillable time over the years than he's brought in. And wrong, 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 wrong. Josh cut Hagner off, reared up over the partner seated between them, and braced the leader of the pack howling for his ouster face to face. There was no attempted rape. And even if we buy her off for five mil, I'm already eight in the black so far this year. More than you, asshole. A lot more. Hagner attacked. You arrogant prick. This time, instead of the table, Hagner's fist went over the partner between them and straight for Josh's face. The sandwich partner leaped out of the way. Josh blocked the blow. Partners scattered and chairs flew as the two men fused and whirled, landing only body blows. Get them apart, Gwen ordered. The younger males pulled the older, expensive-suited men off each other. Josh yelled, Go to hell, you jealous prick. I'll force you out. Josh hated Hagner ever since they both joined the firm on the same day. Why had they hired this damn parsimonious token goy anyway? Josh grabbed his empty cup and left. His juices were flowing, and he needed to fuck. Chapter 7 In his office, Josh cracked open a stylish case of 30-year-old Glenn Levitt. The Cellar Collection version. A nice $6,000 gift from Kristen who was approaching wealthy thanks to Josh. Josh fought with the packing to get a bottle out. Nice, but off the mark. He'll learn I prefer Dalmore. Or not, if his face is now unfixable, unmarketable mincemeat. Josh had transformed Kristen into a top box office action star. The camera ate up this six-foot striking Hispanic alpha male with limited acting talent but a fearless work ethic. Riding out an unplanned avalanche in a mountain film was just one example of that. Like Josh, he too baptized ingenues into the film culture, a culture that expected them to use the gifts between their thighs. At his desk, Josh cracked his new bottle and smiled as he scanned Kristen's huge bill, sitting there marked paid. Then his mind focused on Caitlin. He picked up her headshot. Little Miss No Panties will put out tonight. Or I'll see she never works in this industry. Caitlin had been screened and funneled to him by a very old friend and talent agent, Avi Chodos. Josh had worked with him since his first year at the firm, almost 30 years ago. From the thousands groveling for stardom and wealth in Hollywood, this old agent could still sniff out the prime Y&B talent who knew the game. Avi hooked the chosen ingenues up with his manager, and then with the lawyer to the stars, Josh. These men knew not to hand over a Y&B they had sampled to Josh. They kept the winners for him. Josh wanted them untouched for him and his friends. Overused product was less valuable. Josh poured a short one and then called Caitlin for his first sampling. A booty call. No answer. He serried on his cell for directions to her home, grabbed the bottle of Glenlevitt, and left, unsteady on his feet. A mere detail. Alcohol energized Josh and always had. Chapter 8 Siri's female voice directed Josh to Caitlin's. He weaved down Olympic Boulevard and then up through Beverly Hills to East Hollywood's dense, old apartment buildings interspersed with seedy bungalows. It was not the glamorous, gentrified Hollywood of the stars that parasitic gossip rags depicted worldwide. It was the real Hollywood, the drug-infested cesspool that star-struck hopefuls nested in while they fought to make it in the industry. Short of rent, short of food, short of car insurance. They banded together to put every cent towards acting lessons from the blood-sucking, untalented teachers who never made it. 
These failures, young and old, hung on to the coattails of those still struggling, invariably dragging them down. Josh drove his new toy, his Tesla Model S P100D, through the narrow 1930s streets. They were littered with uninsured, dented, randomly graffitied junk heaps. Behind were paint-starved, grungy, circa 1950s apartments and 1930s bungalows, fronted by tiny weed patches abutted to tree-root-shattered sidewalks. Siri Bluetoothed through the car's surround system. You have arrived at your destination. Josh slurred. Destination? He slammed on his brakes in the middle of the narrow street and stopped in front. Then he parked up half a block on the fire hydrant's red curbing. Like all the upper one percent, Josh considered any color curb his reserved parking place, particularly the red. To him, tickets were merely the price of parking, a deductible business expense, according to his accountant. Josh took a swig from his bottle. He carried it and himself down the center of the street, up a cracked curb, over a broken sidewalk, and through an unhinged, picket-challenged, once-white gate embedded in the storm-wetted brown grass. He staggered up Caitlin's crabgrass-narrowed sidewalk. As Josh stepped onto the creaky porch, a hooded, lanky man leaped from the overgrown bushes under Caitlin's front window. He jumped over the time-worn picket fence to the fractured sidewalk. Ted Ripple, out of reach, shouted, Hey, what do you want, old man? Josh looked around. What? Who? Ted yelled. What do you want? Josh spun around, bottle in hand, meeting aggression with aggression. To draw blood, punk. Ted slithered away from Josh, as he had from Bruce and his security team earlier at the beach. He disappeared down the street. Josh chuckled. That was a great line from Nick's last film, Academy Award Worthy. Having slain the dragon, Josh puffed his chest and snorted a fingernail of coke from his medallion under his shirt. He then mumbled, The homeless should be exterminated. He staggered up to Caitlin's front door and banged on it, felling chips of green paint. He had needs and didn't care about waking Caitlin's neighbors. Ted observed from the street, out of sight. He had been Caitlin's self-appointed guardian since their scene study class in June. To him, their scene from Shakespeare in Love was real, and he had fallen hard for her. He had selected and prepared the scene carefully, copying the dialogue word for word from the film. He was so affected by it and thought Caitlin would be too. But to her, Ted was a loser an unwelcome barnacle, a delusional lonely male who she was afraid to anger. Josh fisted the door and called, Caitlin! The neighborhood and the people who inhabited it disgusted him. To him, merely living there made them failures, one and all. He was there to give Caitlin her escape route if she was nice to him. Real nice. This was the moment of truth, of showing him her commitment to rising above the dung, legs spread. It's Josh, Caitlin. Open up. A man across the street leaned out his door. Hey, asshole, some people have to work in the morning. Josh slurred. Yeah, yeah. With no answer, Josh leaned over to Caitlin's front window and saw the TV flickering through the ill-fitting curtains. He pounded on the door again, bottle in hand. It opened. Josh! Caitlin tucked in her blouse and straightened her long red mane. What are you doing here? Josh shoved his way into the dark living room, strobed by the TV. A naked young blonde on the couch held her T-shirt over her little titties and tattooed midriff. Josh smiled. I'm here for you. And her, she wants to stay. Who the fuck is this, Caitlin? The her asked. Go, just go, Tracy. You sure? 
Josh added, yes. Go, go, go. That's a good girl. The blonde put on her jeans and shirt and swaggered out, jacket and purse in hand. Josh had just witnessed Caitlin's truth. She could feign virtue no longer. He smiled and handed Caitlin the bottle. With calculating eyes, she arched an eyebrow, hesitated, then took a drink, a long one. Innocence did not inhabit this shack. Josh needed another lift. He slid the medallion locket from under his shirt and offered Caitlin her own bump first. A real gentleman. She took a veteran snort and led him to her bedroom. Caitlin was lucky this time. He was too old, too high, and too scotch-infused to demand much. Chapter 9 with the Caitlin deal sealed, Siri guided Josh back out of the bowels of East Hollywood. He needed home and sleep. He headed to his Malibu estate overlooking the Pacific Ocean in an insular, privileged world on Point Doom, south of Zuma Beach, and adjacent to the compound owned by a famous actress and singer. He drove up the Pacific Coast Highway, sandwiched between beach houses, coastside, and eroded cliffs, landside. In the fast lane, he volleyed between the side white lines and the yellow double center lines until uninvited slumber lowered his eyelids. His tires thumped the rubber tabs on the yellow double center lines, dividing the cars speeding north and south. Then Josh drifted over further into oncoming headlights and blaring horns. What the... His lids popped open and eyes bulged, his mind screaming survival. The oncoming cars volleyed away, horns fading. Josh's Tesla fishtailed as he jerked it back into his northbound lane, alert and adrenaline. Shut up, pussies. The PCH takes balls. Damn lanes are getting narrower. Weaving up the PCH to his home, was harder now than in his thirties and forties. But tonight his drive was worth it. Josh drove on, thinking, Caitlin has a magical pussy, and she's into me. If she isn't into me, she sure can act. Her reward? A full-blown launch into the industry, as long as the quid pro quo continued. Josh could and would make anyone a star, for the right price. When Josh entered the guarded gate to the compound and then into his four-car garage, he relaxed. Wall assisted, he made it into his study on the first floor, but no further. He never woke Miriam in the master bedroom when he came in late. They were past fights, the accusations, the justifications. She didn't want to know anything, or him, really. She just wanted an uninterrupted night's sleep. Josh threw his suit coat on the floor, got a glass of Dalmor, and sat on his down-stuffed oxblood leather couch, a couch that cradled him to sleep nightly in his younger years, years when the much younger Nick was his party brother. Nick's wife Linda had long since put an end to that. Josh mumbled, Ah, oh, Nick's a wuss now, but still my moneymaker. He fumbled with the remote until the familiar film noir, Double Identity, popped on the screen. After one sip, he set the scotch on the coffee table and laid back on the soft couch. Through a drowsy haze, he watched Fred McMurray give up his life for a dame. Josh's thoughts went to Caitlin and those legs. He planned to launch her at the polo lounge in Beverly Hills. It was still where industry power brokers and stars gathered for lunch, a place where old codgers paraded their hungry starlets, their new pieces of ass, a place where the paparazzi never failed to get a photo worthy of sale to the Hollywood rags. Soon a deep sleep smothered Josh's thoughts. Chapter 10 
In the early morning, dawn streamed into the study through the tilted walnut plantation shutters. The unwelcome daylight striped across Josh's eyes and into the ten-foot floor-to-ceiling walnut bookcases. Miriam's white Persian cat licked Josh's drool from his chin with its sandpaper tongue. He cracked one eye locking on the feline's green, cold stare as it licked its breakfast off his face, motor purring. What the hell? Josh said as the Persian's rumbling purr shot through his hangover. Get out! Josh bashed the white fur ball into the coffee table. The Persian hissed and clawed Josh, landing a blood-drawing slash. Oh, shit! Josh grabbed his left hand and then jumped up too fast, falling back into the couch. He sat in a stupor. No! The cat, in its docile stupidity, began rubbing Josh's leg. Josh looked down at the purring cat depositing hairs on his Jonathan Bear gray suit pants. Aw, oh, hungry? Come here, pussy. He smiled at his word choice as he wiped the oozing blood on his pant leg. The dry cleaner's problem now. He picked up the animal. I'll take care of you. The petting and purring intermingled as Josh took the feline down the main hall. He passed the closed breakfast room door and proceeded outside. He walked softly across his expansive backyard decks on the coastal cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It was just dawn. The blues, grays, and oranges smeared across the sky, patchworked with gray clouds hugging the horizon. He went to the path along the redwood rails at the edge of the cliff and looked down into the waves crashing on the rocks below. Josh turned the feline. See that, princess? You're going to join your friends. Josh grabbed the nape of the creature's neck as mother cats carry their kittens, rendering them docile and inactive. The Persian's claws neutralized. He wiped his hands dried blood on her fluff. Then he reached out and tossed Princess over the railing. Princess flipped feet first as all cats would, but then flailed as she bounced off the cliff rocks, one after another. Ragdoll limp. Finally, the white fluff disappeared into the green pea soup sea foam churning below. Josh maliciously chuckled. <laughs> Three of Miriam's little friends. Sleep with the fishies, little one. The damn cat had eaten enough prime fish in her day. Miriam always insisted on only the best for her cats carefully selected from the fish counter at Gelson's Market in the Pacific Palisades. Josh turned to go back to his study in peace. As he reached the deck, he saw their housekeeper, Anita Vaccario, looking out her third-floor window. He waved and smiled. Had she seen? She didn't acknowledge his greeting. He was safe. Josh thought, she hates the cat hairs, too. What does she care? He returned to his study and, despite his smarting hand, went back to sleep in undisturbed peace. Chapter 11 At nine, the smell of coffee woke Josh. He dragged himself into the glass-walled breakfast room with a panoramic view of the sky and the ocean. Miriam sat at the table in her yoga pants and t-shirt, reading the news on her tablet. Josh sat opposite. Morning, dear. Miriam did not look up. Morning. Josh reached for the carafe of octane with his pristine right hand, but was intercepted by Anita switching carafes. Signor Josh, fresh for you. Josh smelled the coffee. Ah, nice. Give me my regular, Anita, but two toasts today. Dry. Anita turned and took her hefty ass with her to make his egg white scallion and chanterelle omelet with just a sprinkle of cheddar cheese. 
Josh enjoyed his mug of fresh Maui coffee with cream, his favorite. Miriam, I landed another client last night. Miriam didn't look up from her tablet as she ate her usual yogurt, fruit, and granola. That's great. You'll need one after Nick's mess up yesterday. Miriam had heard the new client routine her whole married life. She was disgusted by Josh's transparent compulsion to give her his plausible deniability spiel after a night of whoring. Long ago, she had stopped caring what he did on his own time, as long as the money kept coming. She had the life she bargained for and found his attempts at marital harmony absurd. All that kept them from living in separate bedrooms was their power couple image and the household help gossiping. Josh dug into his omelet, keeping his scratched left hand on his lap. What are you doing today, dear? You know, exercise, lunch, meetings. Miriam's sphere was and always would be separate from Josh's. Hers alone. Meetings? Miriam scrolled through her tablet. You know, Gold Shield, the UCLA alumni organization. They're in their donation mode. Of course. Watch the checkbook, Josh said between slurps of coffee and bites of omelet. Miriam glared at Josh. I watch everything. A reverberating silence crowded the couple in the spacious breakfast room. Josh poured more cream. He figured his two stents, implanted by the top Santa Monica cardiologist, in his artery called the Widowmaker, would allay any more blockages that were compounded by his lifestyle of rich food and endless alcohol. Miriam broke the silence. Have you seen Princess? No. Josh glanced down at his pant leg. The hair in his blood were obscured by the fine check pattern. Angela said she didn't eat her breakfast. Maybe she ate a bird. Don't be ridiculous. Did you let her out last night? I'd never do that. Josh third-eyed his words, inflection, and demeanor. The guilty were prone to mistakes, if not confessions seeking absolution. She's around. No. Her food is untouched, and Anita searched the house. I'm worried. She'll show up, dear, but security did say that coyotes are crossing PCH looking for food. It's the long drought, global warming and all. Josh thought, when in doubt, blame it on global warming in the drought. Miriam looked out at the sea. I won't get another if she's gone. That's three. It's a death sentence. Up to you, poor little things. Josh saw her eyes well up for a moment. He enjoyed it. She knew he hated cats when they got married. He buried his delight in Miriam's announcement and his head in his ink and paper Los Angeles Times, to which he still subscribed and enjoyed every morning. As he scanned the headlines, careful to hide his scratch, he relived doing Caitlin with her silky porcelain skin. She was no novice. She knew the subtleties of life. She was his new project. He would mold Caitlin into a star, and she would be his. He also fantasized about a threesome with that tattooed blondie muff diver at Caitlin's. Chapter 12 After Tiffany's death and Kristen's face slicing, the studio shelved to deranged. Its publicity department simultaneously and unashamedly spun the incident as an act of nature, a tragic accident. However, like any tragic accident in Hollywood, it was ripe for lawsuits and payoffs. Fingers pointed, lawyers lawyered, sabers rattled. Again, Josh was the savior, the man of the hour. Each of his finely crafted contracts contained clauses that were the death knell for actors who signed them. They required comprehensive, broad, and binding arbitration with impenetrable confidentiality as well. 
those clauses took all disputes out of the courts and into a generally quick though not inexpensive and not unbiased arbitration arena there actors and their loved ones were preordained to get the short stick besides addressing the legal consequences of the accident the studio blitzed public damage control with a fine-tuned news and social media machine tiffany was the beautiful blonde and young the accident was a sexy raw wound and the press picked the scab for months the studios had learned from the twilight zone helicopter deaths that control speed and spin were critical they had to close the incident quickly in fact yesterday with its publicity staff in full gear and its legal department gunning an ambitious vice president volunteered to head the studio's multi-layered legal and damage control task forces from the cats firm josh along with ralph hagner headed the team on the legal front kristen and the studio waived any and all conflicts of interest the studio had secured kristen's favorable testimony for the right price and that testimony was the key to nick's and the studio's absolution for tiffany's death although josh and hagner were rabid enemies within the firm as with all big law firm lawyers they closed ranks and functioned in unison with rapier speed and accuracy against its clients foes the cats firm had a well-earned reputation for taking care of its clients losing was not in their vocabulary winning was not just their focus it was expected it was their code at first variety and the hollywood reporter joined the sag after actors union and the public in questioning the shoot's safety in the raging storm that day the pain of the glamorous was fodder for the flyover states and rumbled across the national news the studio counterpunched by deluging the media with sympathetic but unyielding defenses it blamed mother nature and la's unusual weather pattern at the time born of global warming of course a convenient absolution gradually the incident's public quinsen rating value declined more importantly the actors union fell silent any actor whose head rose too far above the proper level of outrage would never again work in the industry there was a limit to the activist drumbeat now it waned just as it had when the helicopter went down in the water on the twilight zone set the actors union was ultimately intimidated as always the studio suits who ruled the industry and the actors livelihoods again subdued the uproar beyond the studio spin expert publicist mark grossman and his company also stifled the rising tide of public and media hostility nick and josh had shared mark for many years mark's company represented the rich and famous in other words in mark's parlance the financially vulnerable josh with his proclivities was one of mark's most frequent and highest paying clients in mark's creative publicity career he had recast front page felonies into third page misdemeanors for bad boy actors talentless ingenues industry giants corporate leaders and political figures his masterful spinning relegated to nothingness acts criminal and immoral including deaths gunshots murders orgies rapes fights drug dealing substance abuse and prostitution his drunk driving and sexual harassment cover-ups were the talk of legend and for decades saved actors producers directors studio heads and their prominent hired gun lawyers from being exposed let alone taken down mark was the go-to line of protection for every rogue in the industry whether he used payola contacts blackmail or muscle mark was the fixer kristen was the key defense witness for the arbitration 
Since he was Josh's client and negotiated with the studio incestuously through Josh, Christian sold out immediately for the right price. After all, he was vying for his career, angling for the money to repair his face, and opting for a guaranteed future in the industry. With no sound actually recorded due to the storm and water intrusions, he alone was the sole witness to Tiffany's behavior on the platform. Everything hinged on his testimony. Tiffany? She had parents, parents in shock, an ambulance chaser's dream clients. The swarm descended. Chapter 13 by the end of November, Tiffany's mother and stepfather had picked their poison. The L.A. personal injury specialist, Pete Dinelli. He was a new but upstanding member of the plaintiff's bar. A great salesman and smooth talker who agreed to half the take, instead of the normal third. The more seasoned and successful personal injury lawyers in town knew the score, and had passed on the great opportunity, the opportunity of being crushed by the studios. Danelli advised them against taking each of the less than fair, but not in substantial settlement offers. After all, Danelli's half was not what he expected, or more importantly, wanted. The Sims were pliable and Midwest trusting. Dinelli convinced them to take their chances going forward with a wrongful death claim. In this case, that claim did not mean court. It meant binding arbitration under Josh's well-crafted contract. Binding arbitration was effectively a private out-of-court mini-trial. Dinelli, the bloodsucker, skillfully set up his chance for a big kill and big money. Plus, he saw greed not grief in the stepfather's eyes. By the time of the arbitration, the studio had finalized Kristen's settlement for his pro-Nick and pro-studio testimony. In his honest, bought-and-paid-for opinion, Tiffany's death was not a safety issue, just a tragic, unpreventable accident, an act of nature. Kristen played ball with the studios because they were his meal ticket and because of the largesse they had offered him. Treatment at the best plastic surgeon in the famed Beverly Hills Triangle of Youth Peddlers. A three-film deal with lucrative co-producer credits. Finishing Deranged, now on hold. And $8 million to buy the Santa Monica estate on La Mesa Drive that he coveted. The only other witnesses to the incident would likewise be studio-bred and fed, including the eyewitness assistant director, Quinn Kohlberg, soon to direct his own film in exchange for complete honesty. Cinematographer Floyd Tyson, the drone operator, and the crew on set all knew the drill and followed it to keep their salaries, union benefits, and their pick of jobs. Even Bruce, the head of security, gave his honest opinion after the studio set him up in his own security business and three years of guaranteed contracts. In the numerous pre-arbitration settlement negotiations, the defense pounded on the whitewashed testimony that Tiffany had died of a tragic and thoughtless accident. Despite this, her parents followed Dinelli's advice and still refused to settle. Josh's binding arbitration contract provision covered anything and everything, including death and any actions derived therefrom, no matter who the third party was. Binding arbitration meant no second bite of the apple, no appeals, no arguing about the outcome, and almost as importantly, a forever fully enforceable confidentiality clause hiding away the arbitrator's decision. Tiffany's stepfather was the rabid plaintiff with fake tears and a deep itch for big money. Her biological mother, 
who had fed Tiffany's body to the stepfather at 14, was timid and tortured. To get her in line, Dinelli feigned outrage and convinced her to go the distance to prove Tiffany's life meant something. Dinelli, the unaccredited law school graduate who had passed the California bar exam after five tries, saw them as his ticket to the easy life, a life of playing his bass guitar in his band, chasing groupies, and maybe making it big. With his clients primed, the hungry little lawyer agreed to use Katz's offices for the arbitration because the price was right, free. Besides, he looked like a big-time lawyer when he peacocked with bravado to the media outside the immense modern office building. During the arbitration, he rebooted Tiffany's bloody demise as a human interest story, good for both the local and national media ratings. Dinelli also agreed to pick from Katz's list of arbitrators, as long as Katz footed the arbitrator's entire bill at $450 an hour. He told himself and Tiffany's parents that the Jams arbitrators on the Katz list were all ex-judges and therefore professional, neutral, and fair. But Dinelli was young, inexperienced, and willfully idealistic. The ex-judges, in reality, were nothing but paid toadies squatting on their now-private post-retirement benches. Now they all wanted to make real money after sweating out superior court trials day after day for paltry government pay. Each one of them, as Jam's arbitrators, wanted to be wedded to the film industry, corporations, and the rich, who could all afford the highest hourly rates. That was truer than most of Bert Gasser, the Jams judge Dinelli picked from the list the Katz firm provided. Judge Gasser had been a nasty litigator at a middling Mid-Wilshire Los Angeles firm and an arbitrary and habitually unprepared Superior Court judge. Worse, few knew Judge Gasser was biased against all actors, but ingenues in particular. His second wife, a young actress, had deserted him for a hard-bodied movie stuntman. After an injury to the hubby stuntman, they both faded into the drug-ridden Hollywood underbelly. Gasser had endured being a Superior Court judge for a decade, quickly retired, and went directly to jams to get wealthy without passing go and collecting $200. Secretly, his focus had been on money and going to jams from the day the governor appointed him to the bench. The studios liked him because he was as sloppy and lazy as he had been his whole judicial career. Dinelli liked him because Dinelli didn't know any better and hadn't bothered to vet Judge Gasser before picking him. Tiffany's parents trusted Gasser because they were small-town Nebraskans and naively believed that judges were inherently fair and impartial. Chapter 14 The 1st of December, with Los Angeles in full holiday regalia, the arbitration began against Nick in the studio for negligence that stormy evening. Every morning, the arbitration horde elevated to the Katz Law Firm's 8th floor. They paraded down a wide tan marble hallway to one of the big law firm worthy conference rooms. It faced west with floor to 12 foot high ceiling windows overlooking coastal Santa Monica and the ocean beyond. The group sat at the massive conference room table in soft leather swivel chairs. Josh and Rolf gave Dinelli and his clients the side with the view. Not only would it distract them, but it lit up their faces to better read them. It also left the defense side and its witnesses silhouetted and shadowed by the sun's backlighting. It made them less readable by Dinelli, if he knew how to read witnesses at all. In the morning of each session, there was a side table filled with bagels, rolls, coffee, tea, juices. 
and a cheery holiday religion-neutral centerpiece of pine greens and white flowers. This array was both calculated ass-kissing for the arbitrator and kept the hearing caffeined, caloried, and moving forward. Every day, Judge Gasser exercised his prerogatives and took a two-hour lunch break. He billed for the time and expense accounted a pricey meal for himself and his court reporter, his overvalued, giggly, blonde regular, Katrina. The arbitration proceeded with the thoroughness that only the industry and the wealthy could afford. Day after day, witness after witness, bagel after bagel, lunch break after lunch break, objection after objection, argument after argument, ruling after ruling. Judge Gasser was going to bill his pound of flush out of the industry biggie, which they tolerated because of the guaranteed results. In the arbitration room, Josh and Rolf were a unified duo, a well-tuned, magnificent machine, crushing their opponent for the whim. Outside the arbitration room, they handled the media not on the office steps, as Dinelli did, but through channels only the powerful and wealthy had. Channels galvanized by using well-guarded private cell numbers. As always, behind the scenes, Josh and Rolf remained absolute enemies. Rolf still wanted Josh out of the firm, but Josh remained ensconced. They sabotaged each other in firm politics to get credit for their inevitable arbitration whim. Nothing could improve their relationship. However, they remained interim comrades, fighting a mutual enemy for their good the good of the order, and the firm's economic bottom line, period. During the arbitration, Danelli put on an aggressive show for Tiffany's parents. He had them testify with practiced emotion, called a meteorologist expert to describe and swear to the dangerous conditions, and had two has-been infomercial directors testify that they would never have done the take in such a storm. In defense, Rolf and Josh won the battle of the experts with three highly credentialed meteorologists and four renowned industry directors affirming with complete certainty they would have proceeded with the scene in the conditions that existed that day. Additionally, Kristen testified that Tiffany was happy to do the last take. Indeed, that she had told him out there in the ocean that she insisted on doing it. Thus, as expected, Nick testified favorably for himself and the studio, as did the other witnesses who lived off the industry. Cameramen and women, key grips, Nick's friend Floyd Tyson doing the long shot, and, of course, the drone operator, who controlled the lethal drone that had killed Tiffany and maimed Kristen. After all, the industry is where fictional stories were created and told with conviction every day to entertain. It was a small step to this arbitration, where the purpose was not entertainment. It was to win. The studio vice president in charge was pleased with Josh's updates, but more pleased to hear positive feedback from Rolf, the real litigator on the team. On a Friday morning, the last day of the arbitration hearing, in rebuttal to the defense case, Dinelli recalled Kristen. He had decided Kristen, an action-adventure actor not known for his brain power, was vulnerable to misspeaking. Interrogating Kristen was Dinelli's Hail Mary to bolster his viable but weakening case for liability. Mr. Alba, Dinelli asked, Did Tiffany ever ask you to get out of the ocean? No. Did she ever say she was afraid or worried? Kristen began. She, Rolf, interrupted. Objection, compound. Sustained, Judge Gasser ruled as he stirred the sugar in his coffee. Danelli snapped. Come on, Mr. Alba, you know what I mean. 
Was she afraid? Kristen glanced at Nick and then looked straight at Danelli. No. Rolf did not interrupt. He saw that Kristen actually had a brain. He had been instructed to say yes or no and not volunteer anything. And he was doing it beautifully. Was she worried? Danelli hammered. No. Danelli turned away, wiped his forehead, and thought. Then he turned back around and verbally accosted Kristen. Mr. Alba, you settled with the defendants for millions of dollars, didn't you? Uh, you were bought off, weren't you? I... Rolf interrupted. Objection. Not only was Mr. Alba not bought off, as counsel suggests, Mr. Alba, if he settled at all, is contractually precluded from disclosing that fact and any particulars concerning it. Mr. Dinelli knows that, and that his client, Miss Sims, was party to the same type of contract with the same confidentiality clause. And, Your Honor, Dinelli got a copy of that contract in discovery. Judge Gasser didn't hesitate. Sustain, Mr. Dinelli. Move on. Dinelli rustled through his notes and then said, We rest, Your Honor. Dinelli sat with an air of bravado and confidence, oblivious to his abject, disgraceful defeat in the rebuttal questioning of Kristen. He believed he had made it abundantly clear by innuendo that Kristen had been bought and sold, and for millions. In his mind, limited as it was, that negated all of Kristen's testimony. It might have in a jury trial, but this was not that. Closing arguments took the rest of the day. Josh slipped out to his office for a little snort to keep him awake through Denali's two-hour, incoherent display of fiction, fact, and distorted law. During Dinelli's entire fumbling effort, he paced like a little Napoleon before his exile to the island of Alba. Rolf countered with an organized, hard-hitting hour of factually substantiated closing argument, backed up with abundant and pertinent legal authority. Dinelli's rebuttal argument was a painful, disorganized three minutes. His last words were as flaccid as his closing a condition with which he was all too familiar. He had been totally unprepared for the surgical precision of Rolf's closing. When Dinelli finally sputtered to a halt, Judge Gasser took the case under submission. I'll give you my ruling a week from this coming Monday. That time frame gave him an additional nine days to suck more money from the studio, weighing the evidence. It also guaranteed him his check before Christmas. Gasser spent those days in his modest Brentwood home, nestled among mansions and mega-mansions. He contemplated the facts of the case at his desk, in the gym, in the shower, or watching golf on television. He billed every minute at $450 an hour. After all, his mind never stopped did it. He also billed to plan a vacation to Bora Bora, possibly with the giggly Katrina, or to troll for other talent, but definitely first class considering his arbitration hourlies. Judge Gasser wanted to be validated as a pro-studio lackey, a tangential cog in the industry. Since the studio was picking up the entire bill, the subtext was always a quid pro quo win for them. After his ruling, Judge Gasser looked forward to many more lucrative industry gigs. Waiting for the ruling, Josh handheld other high-profile clients and made deals for his talent. Nick worked on resurrecting his film, Deranged, after the new year, and Kristen was almost healed and busily spending his largesse. Tiffany's parents, at the end of their budget, sequestered themselves in their cut-rate motel in San Gabriel, east of downtown. With high hopes for a favorable ruling from Judge Gasser, they watched the tube, drank beer, and ate fast food. Donnelly was convinced he had done his job 
and fantasized about a windfall, getting gigs for his band, and gifting expensively at his family's big Italian Christmas. Chapter 15 In a misty drizzle the Saturday evening before Judge Gasser announced his decision, Nick and his wife Linda waited in their BMW for their driveway gates to open. The windshield wipers pulsed slowly as the Clarens pulled out onto the north side of San Vicente Boulevard in Santa Monica. For an instant, passersby could voyeur the rich and famous lifestyle. The Clarens' 12,000-square-foot modern mansion on six prime manicured acres. The couple was late for Josh's yearly holiday party. Neither of them cared. They hated their yearly obligatory appearance at his holiday bash. It was exclusive, but as magnificent and exclusive as the party always was, it was a long drive to Point Doom in the now snail-like L.A. traffic. More than that, they had been there and done that too many times. As Nick gunned into the westbound traffic, Linda asked, Tiffany's parents, they're going to lose Monday, aren't they? Of course. The Hayseeds and their green lawyer are... Leave it, dear. I get it. Linda, seasoned in the industry, knew the behind-the-scenes arbitration strategy. It always resulted in a pro-industry decision with a confidentiality clause. The clause hid the truth and the inner workings of the arbitration process. The captive tribunal forced confidential settlements or rulings on talent and industry underlings to save the studios and the upper echelons money. Nick said, They should have settled. Now they'll get zero. But I can finally get deranged back on track. Nick's 700 series BMW coiled through the Santa Monica Canyon to the coast and up Pacific Coast Highway towards Malibu. The drizzle turned to rain. Linda asked, Will Kristen be at Josh's? No, he's going under the knife again. Again? With his three-film deal, he needs that face. Nick glanced at Linda. I pushed too hard that day. No one pushed back. A judgment call. I want to believe that. If only Tiffany hadn't. If this, if that. Put it behind you, Nick. You're right. No looking back. Nick crawled in the PCH rain-slowed traffic, like snow to L.A. drivers. No redos, Linda thought. She had her regrets, too, giving up her acting for Nick's home, family, and career. But then, woman could not have it all. Nick chuckled. <laughs> Damn, you should have seen her corn-fed Nebraska mother cry on cue every day. That's where Tiffany learned to act. A real show? Yep. Our lawyers wore them out and tore their so-called experts apart. Good. That's the game. It's over Monday and the arbitrator knows where his future lies. Linda knew the industry. She was a Tiffany when she left acting to marry Nick in his lean years. He had directed her in her first and only starring film role. An independent that catapulted them both to the A-list. He wasn't the first director she had slept with to try to get a part. Just the first to give her one in return. They married and became an unbeatable duo. Nick, the industry breadwinner, and Linda, the support at home. Through the years, she had devoted herself to her four children, Nick, her home, and later to their breathtaking rose garden featured in several magazines. Now her children had their own lives, she indulged herself by taking bit parts in Friends films. Nick broke their silent interlude. A penny for your thoughts. Linda lied. I was just thinking about the film and if Kristen is going to be ready. Oh, his tests with the new Tiffany were good. I'll shoot around that side of his face. 
I'm glad it worked. I like him. Yeah, I do too. The problem is, even though I'm revving up, the studio's still bitching over budget, jinx, you name it. Linda patted Nick's knee. They'll settle down. Maybe, but I think I have to put some skin in the game. You have a green light from me. It's a winner. It will be with my new hopeful, Caitlin O'Keefe. You'll meet her tonight. Her test with Christian was electric. Josh is again? Of course. Linda said nothing. What was there to say? She had already said it all, again and again, about this man whore. The drive on PCH North was once an unpopulated, rustic pleasure, except for small wood beach homes on the sand. Now there was a steady cavalcade of strip malls, restaurants, shopping centers, the Getty Museum complex, Pepperdine University, and the never-ending construction, both of mansions up on the unstable hills fighting for their piece of ocean views, and on the beach, fighting the Coastal Commission to build as high as they could on the little postage stamp lots. They all ignored the frequent Malibu fires and the ocean beating against their dream homes. After all, they were insured. Nick turned off the squeaking windshield wipers. Look, the rain stopped. Rain or no rain, I still hate going to Josh's. I hate Josh. You'll have to behave, won't you? Linda rolled her eyes. Of course, I'm an actress. But Miriam should divorce that man whore. Don't start, Linda. Why? Their life works for them. It won't when his firm gets rid of him. Nick glanced over at Linda. That's between you and me. But poor Miriam. Don't tell her. She'll find out when he gets the boot. Soon? January 1st, if it happens. He's still fighting. How can he fight it? Trying to rape an associate? from his own firm, in his own home? Nick put a period on the conversation. We'll see. Chapter 16 The Clarens reached the Point Doom Drive turnoff and were swarmed by paparazzi as the cars entered the community. The paparazzi carefully stayed off private property, but took pictures of the celebrities through car windows as the line crawled forward to the Steins estate's entrance. Cameras zoomed in when the drivers of the rich and famous, or the rich and famous themselves, gave names to the guard. Nick and Linda Claren were on the list. They were on every A-list in the industry. Moreover, their names were on every donor's list at every event and every venue including the UCLA Griffith Theater, the Fire and Ice Ball, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, its sibling, the Museum of Contemporary Art, St. John's Hospital, and all the right places. As Nick gave their names, the cameras flashed and strobed the night into day. Nick, look! Linda shielded her eyes from the flashes. What? Something went over the wall behind the oleander bush. A man, I think. Nick patted Linda's knee. Relax, dear. You're in Malibu. There's wildlife. It's the country. Country? Really? <laughs> Linda laughed. Tell that to the flyover states. Soon, first-rate, red-jacketed valets greeted the Clarens and took their BMW to park it in the ample parking area on the Stein Estate grounds. The car was devoid of everything personal. For valets, there was payola for anything from an industry high-profiler. Caitlin's faded blue dented Oldsmobile Cutlass pulled up behind the Clarens. Hello, Nick! Caitlin left her keys, trotted over to Nick, and gave him a Hollywood air kiss, her cleavage breast pressing into him. Nick stepped back. Caitlin, this is my wife, Linda. Linda, it's an honor to meet you. I've seen your film. It's such a classic. You were a female Brando. We all study it. Thank you. 
The singular word film, which Caitlin had adopted as the industry lingo, pierced Linda's mind, mocking the decision she had made years ago to have a family and be a helpmate. But times were different then. Women rarely had it all or even got the chance. A lifetime ago, she traded an exclusive layout with her rose garden in Los Angeles magazine for what should have been an exclusive run for an Oscar win in the Los Angeles Times, People, Variety, and The Hollywood Reporter. Linda watched Caitlin suck up to Nick, giggling in her skin-tight red dress. Caitlin had homaged Linda, and although possibly genuine, Linda was not disarmed. She loathed the look in her husband's eyes as the two talked. She had seen it before, and before, and before. Through the years, Linda had endured and behind the scenes undermined each of Nick's affairs. She had kept their status as a power couple sterling, and she had kept her family together. Linda had not given up her budding acting career to be left as a divorced has-been in a no-fault divorce state that allowed men just to walk away. There would be college graduations, weddings, births, baptisms, funerals. She would not attend those life events watching Nick draped by a clone of her, but 20 years younger. For her, even 50% of their amassed community wealth would not be enough to compensate her for destroying her home and family. More than that, Linda loved Nick deeply. And even though her friends were courting her for projects as a mature actress, female acting comebacks were historically short-lived industry curiosities the studios merely cashed in on. She was not going to be a divorced, aging actress who popped in and out of films. She had already done an unsatisfying cameo appearance in one film and an even smaller, less rewarding role in another. In the industry, the Y and Bs ruled, and had since film was celluloid. Only exceptional talents like Betty Davis and Joan Crawford could pull off a box office bonanza and critical over-the-hill acting triumph as they did in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. The three partygoers entered the Steins showcase home together. The clatter and music blasted them as they took flutes of champagne from the passing trays. The vaulted entry hall was designed with a view through the immense living room to the lighted back decks atop the Malibu cliffs and beyond to the dark ocean ringed with a necklace of coastal lights running all the way down to the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Nick escorted the two women into the gathering of suited lawyers, diamond wives, hip gangsters from Cat's music department, studio executives, the who's who of the industry, groveling newcomers, hangers-on, and legendary film icons, all competing for attention with the newly minted firm-skinned stars nipping at their heels. Josh's party had become the event of the season, not because of him, but because of the style in which his wife Miriam staged it. Nick whispered to Linda, I don't see many of his partners here. What did you expect? Josh is on the way out. Caitlin interrupted, Don't you love it? This is outrageous. Linda lied. We look forward to it every year. Caitlin drank her champagne and scanned the movers and shakers of the film world. She was wide-eyed. Every year? Amazing! The three were surrounded by Miriam's theatrically perfect celebration of the season. Christmas and Hanukkah decorations sparkled red, green, blue, white, and silver throughout the house, in the heated tents beyond, on the decks, in the pool house, surrounding the tennis courts, and winding to the top of the three 50-foot redwoods in the backyard. Servers with trays of Epicurean hors d'oeuvres and champagne streamed through the guests. Strategically placed throughout were full bars and manned stations serving everything from sushi 
sashimi, and raw oysters to fillet sliders and mini tacos. The dessert tables towered with miniaturized Napoleons, unique cupcakes, bite-sized artisan cheesecakes, and the latest craze of gourmet Rice Krispie treats. While first-rate chefs served at the stations, the trays were balanced and paraded by aspiring industry hopefuls looking for a break in a buck. Every waiter in L.A. had a story, together with a script or a headshot. Swag bags waited for the guest on their later departure at the front door. They were filled with promotional gifts that rivaled the quarter-million-dollar Oscar bags. Each was filled with donated retail items in hopes of gaining future rich and famous customers. Shinola watches, made in Detroit by homegrown workers, Tiffany diamond-studded personalized keychains, and certificates for day spas, wines, designer cosmetics, and restaurants. Miriam swept in across the immense open living room to greet the Clarens with Hollywood air kisses. My two favorite people. Nick smiled and mirrored Miriam's enthusiasm. Caitlin, meet Miriam, our hostess. Caitlin here is Josh's newest client and the new co-star with Kristen in Deranged. I've had the pleasure. Miriam's eyes were stone cold as they burrowed into Caitlin, remembering when she saw Caitlin defiling her deck lounge with her husband. Lovely home. Caitlin purred maliciously, basking in the knowledge that Miriam was powerless against her control over Josh. With Caitlin's verbal slap across her face, Miriam grabbed Linda's arm. Can I speak to you in the study, dear? As Miriam dragged Linda through the tangle of guests down the hall, Linda glanced back at Nick. He stepped close to Caitlin with a charming smile. Linda wanted to go back and rip the eyes out of this fertile, mesmerizing female machine. Chapter 17 Left with Champagne and Caitlin, Nick studied her full lips caressing the flute and then her tongue licking the bubbly dripping over the rim. He thought, Josh's property, for now. Josh was legendary for his sexual exploits that sealed the deal with his ingenues. Sex prefaced every female business relationship in Josh's life. His choice, his power. Half the Oscar-winning actresses had done him in one way or another, and they thanked the lech at the Oscars in front of the whole world. Josh's little club of the sexually exploited, drunk, drugged, intimidated, or just plain ambitious, kissed the man's ass publicly just as they had his dick in private. Glittering in the holiday lighting, Caitlin's gray eyes entranced Nick. He was her director now, and he wanted her. She was a free agent, unchained from Josh if she wanted to be. Those were the rules. And who wouldn't want to be free of Josh? especially a young woman as magnificent as Caitlin. Caitlin took Nick's arm. She led him out to the layered decks beyond the dramatic vaulted hall and living room. He went willingly. As they passed the party-goers, heads turned and eyes riveted on Caitlin's intoxicating, willowy beauty with her red mane swinging at her waist. Men wanted her. Women wanted to be her. Caitlin's aura disrupted a tattooed couple's cocaine fix from the woman's locket. White powder from her pinky snowed down her cleavage. Nick's assistant director, Quinn's gaze, followed Caitlin voraciously. He not only had his job back on Deranged, but would have Caitlin's presence to breathe in every day on the set. As Nick escorted Caitlin, he scanned the throng. He felt the electricity, the magnetic draw. Men undressed her. Women envied her. Caitlin had it, whatever it was. He hadn't felt this since he had transformed Linda into a leading lady so many years ago. 
like Justice Stewart on the United States Supreme Court said, he knew pornography when he saw it. Likewise, in a woman, a director knew it when he saw it, and Caitlin emanated it from every inch of her sinewy porcelain body, limbs exposed in her skin-tight red strapless dress, resting as low on her cleavage as it was high on her thighs. This leggy, stunning gift to the party-goers, especially the males, was crowned by that flaming red foliage of hair, quaffed and shiny for the occasion. The couple was swarmed. The human animal needed to touch and be touched by this it-girl, to be near her, know her, feel her, hear her. Nick observed as the average magneted to Caitlin's exquisite radiant aura, her platinum star power. He wanted her as much as they did. He also wanted her in more of his films. Josh broke through the circle of the curious and envious. Caitlin, honey, glad you're here. He kissed her on the lips and stroked her hair, a male dog pissing to mark his territory. The circle scattered, all but Nick, who stood tall. Josh took an extra piss on Nick. Where's Linda? Your wife. Nick gave as good as he got. With yours. Chapter 18 Miriam took Linda to Josh's study, locked the double doors, and poured two scotches. Miriam sat with Linda on the leather couch, the firms trying to expel Josh again. Nick told me, I'm so sorry. Did Josh tell me? Hardly. I have my ways. Miriam, dear, don't worry. They need him. He just had to try it with an associate, a lawyer, for God's sake, and on my deck. Linda sipped her scotch. Bad move. Linda listened to Miriam's same old problems, but pictured Nick alone with the friendly Caitlin. Miriam added, And then last week, I came home early and caught him on the same deck with that red-headed whore out there. You mean Caitlin? Miriam fought her tears of anger. Oh, yeah. And he knows the rules. No whoring in my home. That's horrible. Linda downed her drink to get back to Nick and separate him from Caitlin. Miriam went on. Josh saw me at the window but didn't stop. He grabbed her hair and pushed her down to her knees. She liked it. Damn him. I could have killed them both. Miriam touched her cheek, wiping the black mascarid tears from her fingertips. Oh no, I'm a mess. Linda grabbed a tissue and her mirrored makeup kit from her purse. Here, I'll fix it. We better get back. Miriam stopped crying but still vented. And why the associate? Brains are dangerous but lawyers deadly. Her and her she-group Me Too buddies are tearing them apart. Harassment claims. Criminal prosecution in the wings. Public humiliation. I'm so sorry, Linda said. Miriam raged. He should have stuck to his specialty. Hungry young actresses with no brains. <laughs> That's us, brainless. Linda chuckled. Sorry, Linda. I always forget you were an actress. No offense. None taken. Linda's lips belied her thoughts. At least I'm smart enough to keep that trash out of my house. Nick may have screwed a few bimbos, but not in our home. But Miriam's complaints were too close to home. The only difference between Nick and Josh was that Nick had the looks to cheat with the willing, the willing who took their quid pro quo and moved on. Trouble was rare. Josh, on the other hand, was a fat, smelly little old troll who had to use force, alcohol, drugs, and or his industry power to get what he wanted. Besides, for years, Linda had been able to control Nick's wandering predilections with family doings. Their kids were grown now, though, and she was worried again. She loved Nick, and she loved her family, life, and status. 
Linda refinished the window dressing on Miriam's stretched, filled, and lasered face. Done. Ready, Miriam? Great job. Miriam's discerning eyes approved of the repair job she saw reflected in Linda's small mirror. You look wonderful. We'd better get back. Linda thought of Caitlin out there and shuddered as she stared at Miriam's repaired reflection and saw her future. And don't worry, Miriam. Josh has. Linda was interrupted by party-goers' screams, piercing the thick wood doors into the study. Something's wrong. What the hell is that? Miriam propelled her scotch-infused, glitter-draped, and surgically sculpted body to the door. She steadied herself with the handle and fought with the lock. Miriam, be careful. Linda grabbed her things and followed. It's my house. Miriam threw the doors open. I'll take care of it. Miriam and Linda pushed through the chaos toward the eye of the storm, the nearby cliff deck. Women were retreating from the railed edge, shrieking and squealing. Males aided the cleavaged females, jiggling and tottering on their spiked Dolce Cabanas, Jimmy Choo's, Pradas, and knockoffs on the wannabes. The drunk and the high partygoers fed on the pandemonium. Phones held above the crowd taped videos and snapped pictures. Even the groups doing lines in the guest house emerged wiping white powder off their faces. Bruce and his security bulldozed through the rush of humanity retreating and the spectators clustered near the scene. Miriam and Linda fell in behind Bruce's machine. Get free on YouTube or at your library. Also on Audible, iBooks, and worldwide stores. Get all authors' books free from your library. Go to the author's website for your own personal library portal, dalemanalakis.com.